We started a little mini-series uh, last uh, Sunday um, just talking about understanding our identity, our worth, and our value in God. We're simply calling the series Worth, Understanding Our Value. Um, this is part two. Uh, last week, we looked at how the enemy uh, has been using the same tactics really since the beginning back in the Garden of Eden uh, to uh, pull us off and draw us away from the identity that God has given to us as his created people. Uh, we were meant to walk in harmony with God, uh, fellowshipping with him uh, every day, um, just being this, this family with God. Uh, that's how we were created. Of course, sin uh, broke that, and God had to do some things to get back into uh, fellowship with people. We called it the covenant. We preached about that here a few weeks back. And, and so we're kind of tying this stuff together. And so the enemy's been using the same attacks to attack our identity in order to pull us away from understanding our value and, and thus distracting us away from our purpose. Because if you don't know your value in God, you'll not know you have a purpose in God to fulfill in the earth. And, and he's been using those things. And so he, you know, remember she looked at the fruit and the enemy came up to her and gave her the fruit and, and, and she looked at it and, it's, and then the Bible says when she saw that it was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes, and that it was desirable to make one wise, right? So he hit her to, at her flesh. Uh, he hit her um, to where her, her pride was, right? Um, and, and he hit her, obviously, to, uh, to her possessions. And so uh, we, we learned that he, he, he didn't stop there. He, he's using the same tactics ever since then. He tried them on Jesus in the, in, in the, in the wilderness when he tempted Jesus with three, three methods or three ways, all to distract him away from his purpose, get him off of his identity. And then, of course, later on, we found out in the Word in the New Testament that uh, this is a warning to us as believers that the enemy is going to attack us. How? Three ways. Through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He hadn't thought of anything new since the beginning. He, he's, he's really not. He's a uh, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't have any original thoughts, and so he uses the same, same tactics. And so here we are. We're going to pick up right here in part number two. I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You're probably going to want to look up here on the screen. Uh, you're, you're welcome to turn to it, but I'm reading this on purpose from the message translation, reading this passage this morning. Normally, I'm in the New King James, but this morning, I'm in the message for this particular verse. First, uh, chapter 11, verse number three, it says it like this, the Apostle Paul talking, and he says now, he says, and now I'm afraid. And so I just want you to pause and, and realize that the Apostle Paul just admitted to something that causes him to be afraid. And he tells us what that is. He said that is exactly as the snake seduced Eve with his smooth tongue. So we talked about this last week. You are being lured away from the simple purity of your love for Christ. The key to loving Christ is understanding that you are loved by Christ. You understand this morning? Before you can genuinely give love to Jesus, you have to realize that you need to receive love from Jesus. Otherwise, it's just patter. It, 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 means, it means nothing. And I can prove that to you, by the way, from the scriptures. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, very popular. It simply says it like this. We love him. Everybody say the next word. Because... because <laughs> He first loved us, okay? We love him. There's a reason why we love him, because he first loved us. Last week, we talked about it like this. We said that your value is not the result of your performance. It's the cause of it. In other words, uh, your, your performance, uh, your value doesn't come from how well you perform. You, you perform based on how well you know you're valued because it, 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 it draws on you to want to love him more and more each and every day because of how much he loves you. Okay, I want us to continue to build on this theme and, I, and we're going to look at a parable that's found in Matthew chapter 13. Now let me set this up for you because in Matthew 13, the theme is the kingdom of heaven. 
So Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of heaven. That's the theme. And he, he talks about the kingdom of heaven by using parables. There's actually, in Matthew 13, there's actually seven different parables that he reveals about the kingdom of heaven. Six of the seven, he starts the parable off by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he'll talk about something, okay? Uh, today, we're going to look at uh, the, the shortest parable in Matthew 13, it's only a one-verse parable, okay? Here we are. We're in Matthew 13, verse 44. And what I want you to do is I want you to, to notice the three words that I have underlined for you, okay? We'll get to that in a moment. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man, we'll talk about who that is, found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. All right. You've all heard that before, right? Most of, most of you, most of you, if you've been in church for a minute or two, you've heard this parable taught. Can I say that most of the time when we've heard this parable taught, the interpretation is that the field is the treasure. We are the man. So let me, let me, let me back it up. I, I misspoke, sorry. The kingdom, because we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom is the treasure. We are the man. And we gave up everything to get the kingdom. Most of the time, most of the time, uh, and it'll be, it'll be kind of thrown out this way. You have to give up your life. You have to be crucified with him. Give up everything you've got to follow Jesus. You've got to give up that old way of sin. So, so there's, there's genuine reasons for why that's taught. I'm not taking anything away from anything like that. But most of the time, and by the way, I looked at almost every one of the commentaries that I have in my office, Bible commentaries, and every one of them fell into the same line of interpretation right there that uh the the kingdom is the treasure we are the man and we gave up everything to get the kingdom I, i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you a few reasons why there's a problem with that okay um if we are the man in that parable number one you can't find it the kingdom you can't find it. Uh, Jesus said, if anyone's going to come to me, before you can come to me, it, the, the, the heavenly Father, the Spirit of God draws you. In other words, nobody gets to me unless the Spirit of God, the Father, draws you to me. In other words, you didn't just accidentally stumble onto the gospel of the kingdom message one day. Amen. You might, someone might, a friend or family member shared the gospel with you. you. You came to church and you heard the gospel. You read it somewhere. You, what, 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 whatever, whatever. But if you, if you heard the gospel and you received Jesus by faith, it is only, please understand this, it is only because the Father drew you to himself. By the way, how, what does that say about how valuable you are? That out of 8 billion people on the planet, God, the creator of the universe, took time out to find you and draw you to himself. That's so good. So good. So good. Amen. And number two, so you can't find the kingdom, you can't hide the kingdom. Uh, you might be able to hide the kingdom from showing out in your life, right? I, I know some secret agent Christians who, they're, they're believers, but it is a very highly concealed secret. Nobody knows it, not their friends, not their coworkers. Uh, most of their family members, they don't know it. It's just between them and God. It's a highly concealed, we call them secret agent Christians. 
So, so it is possible for you to hide the light of the kingdom from shining out in your life, but you can't hide the kingdom from showing up. You can't do it. It's too big and you're not big enough, right? God is revealing himself in the earth. There is a revival of salvation that is sweeping through the world. And now the question is, are you going to be a part of that or not? All right? Uh, so you, you can't hide heaven. In fact, let me just spin that around on you and say that you can't hide heaven, but heaven did hide you. Yes, yes, sir. I, I, this isn't, guys, I don't have this up here. I'm going to do an audible right now, okay? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm dropping back. I'm, I'm, throwing, I'm throwing a route pattern right here. Okay, I'm going to do an audible, okay? Uh, got your Bibles with me. Is this okay if I take a few minutes? We got done a little bit earlier. It's okay if I preach for a couple hours here? Okay, watch this. Okay, watch this. Uh, Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Okay, here we go. You don't have to turn to it. I'll read it to you. Philippians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. Let's start in verse 1. Colossians chapter 3. If then you were raised with Christ, someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. You know why he's sitting? Because his work's already finished. <laughs> You're going to sit and rest when you already know who you are and what you've accomplished. Amen. So, he's seated, he seated at the right hand of God, verse 2. So, therefore, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Get your mind going in the right direction. 4, verse 3. Here's, here's what I want to show you. For you died, so you died with Christ, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You say, Pastor, I, I don't know, where, I don't know what, what that means. I don't even know where we're going with that. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. I have looked up every translation that I had available to me, from the King James all the way down through paraphrases, and every one of them say the same thing, that your life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words... Your life is just as secure with God or in God as Jesus is. Hallelujah. You know that? You are just as secure in the Father as Jesus is. Amen. Hallelujah. And he's pretty secure. You. Can you even fathom? Do you understand how safe you are in God? You're not, not convinced yet? I, you, don't, you don't have to turn there. John chapter 10 Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and my Father has given them to me, and no one can snatch them out of my hands. Amen. And he goes on and says, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. So here we go. You're in Jesus' hands. You're in the Father's hands. Translation? You're in good hands. Yeah. <laughs> hey, just like all state, right? Although it's better than all state, right? You, you want to know the big difference between being in Jesus' hands and being in all states' hands? You stop making that premium payment and you'll find out just how good those hands really are, amen? But how many of you know the payment that was made for you to be in God's hands has already been paid for? And there's no expiration date on it. Glory to God. Amen. You are in good hands. Amen. Okay. So you can't find it. And number two, you can't hide it. Here's number three. You can't buy it. Can you, can you give me that verse up there again? No, no, that next one, the last one. There you go. You can't, you can't, you can't hide it. You can't find it. And you can't, you can't buy it. You, you, you can't. Uh, and I'll, I'll, even, I'll even prove it to you. You, you, can't, you can't earn your way into heaven. In fact, let me just say it like this. Just the opposite is true. Just the opposite is true. You didn't buy heaven. Heaven bought you. 
Amen. I can prove it to you. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 20, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Okay. So pastor Doug, what then is the meaning of the parable? The field is the world. For God so loved the world. Now, if we jump up just a few verses, Jesus teaches us about the, he gives us the parable about the wheat and the tares. Uh, we don't necessarily need to turn there, but when he explains that parable in verse 24 of this same chapter, Jesus says it like this, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Later that day, the disciples asked him, what did that parable mean about the wheat and tares? And Jesus answered this in verse 38, the field is the world. You, you want to, there's no mystery, no mystery. The field is the world. So he explains it to us. So then how can we jump down just a few verses later and not understand what he's talking about? The field is the world. Uh, the man is Jesus. And the treasure is you and me. You're treasured by God. Now, I, I realize this morning that that, that might not fit into your legal definition and description of your relationship with the Lord that you grew up with or how you've felt about your role in the kingdom of God. But I'm telling you, you are a treasure to God and Jesus said so himself. Now, that was my introduction. Okay, can we, can we start the message now? So when we look into the Old Testament... Uh, we find that there are two groups of people. There are Jews and there are Gentiles, okay? The Hebrew people, the Jewish people, and Gentiles. God, uh, because of Adam and Eve's sin, um, was now on the outside looking in, needed to uh, get himself into relationship with, with his people, and so he made a covenant with a man by the name of Abraham. I'm not going to give you the whole history lesson, but you guys get the foundation. And he spoke to Abraham and he said, Abraham, uh, a great nation is going to come out of you. And from your seed, uh, there is going to be one generation after the next that that seed that's going to come out of you, a great people are going to come out of you. And then God began to speak the blessing that I'm going to bless you, Abraham, exceedingly and abundantly uh, in the earth. And those who bless you, I will bless. And so uh, that blessing, by the way, did not stop with Abraham and his immediate family. It continued on past Isaac, past Jacob, got, you know, in Joseph and, and through, it continued on all the way for generation after generation. That bloodline was blessed by God. Problem. The people in that bloodline did not always honor God. And so they broke their part of the covenant between them and God. They, they dishonored God. They rebelled against God. Uh, they turned their backs on God. And so God established a system whereby the people would get back into right standing with him uh, through something called a blood covenant. And so that blood covenant simply meant that they would take uh, in proxy uh, the blood of an animal and they would, they would kill the animal and they would take that blood. The high priest would walk it into the Holy of Holies, uh, past the veil into the holiest part where the Ark of the Covenant was, the mercy seat, and the high priest every year, once a year, would sprinkle the blood of that animal onto the mercy seat on behalf of the sins of the people. Why? Because without the shedding of blood... There is no remission for sin. And so God did this for the people. The problem is this, was ha this would happen year after year after year for generations. And it wasn't a perfect uh, setup. It was flawed because people are flawed. The people are flawed. And, and as long as people are involved, as long as, it, as people, dependent on people, 
It was never going to be perfect. It, it, it had to take a perfect man to be able to accomplish this, this to make it perfect. And so God came up with the plan uh, that he would send his, his son into the earth and make a once and for all final sacrifice and shed his blood. And when Jesus died on the cross, uh, watch this, that the veil of the, the earth shook, the veil of the, of, the, of the temple ripped wide open. And for the first time, the people were able to look inside of that holy place all the way into the holy of holies. And they didn't have to have a high priest go in on their behalf. Why? Because Jesus is now their advocate and their high priest. Glory to God. Amen. Jesus is now their high priest. And so that's why, that's why we now call on our high priest. And he goes in on before us and he is ever making intercession for us. Seated at the right hand of God, resting in his work and his accomplishments. Glory to God. I don't know if this does anything to you this morning. This is just getting, this is just moving on me today. Amen. Amen. So he made that, he made that switch in the earth. All right. So Jesus is coming to the earth. When he came to the earth, 33 years, the Bible says that he came for his own people. The lost sheep of Israel. But it also says that they did not receive him and they rejected him. All through the New Testament, we see this showing up. How he come, he came to, through the gospels. He came through, he came into the earth for his people. Uh, one of the examples of that is in, I believe it's Matthew 15. You don't, you don't turn there. Um, a Canaanite woman uh, came to Jesus one time. She is not part of that bloodline. She's not part of the Abrahamic bloodline. She's, she's a Canaanite woman. And her, her daughter has been possessed by a demon. And so she, she, she begs Jesus to heal her daughter. And this, this is what Jesus says. He says, I have not been sent, but to the lost sheep of Israel. In other words, darling, don't take this the wrong way, but you're not in the right bloodline. You're not, in, you're, you're not in the right stock. You're outside of that bloodline, so, so I haven't been sent for that yet, okay? It's, 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 and then she persisted, and she persisted, and watch what Jesus said. You, you, some of you, if, you never read this, if you've never read this before, you're not going to believe it, but it's in the Bible, okay? Jesus says, it, it is not right to take bread for the children, talking about the children of Israel in that bloodline, and cast it to the dogs, called her a dog now I don't know about you and I don't know about you but when I when I read when I read that for the very first time one time I thought Jesus was that really you because it's not the Jesus we all heard about right but he but he's he's making a point he's about ready to make a he's about ready to change history right here in a minute okay and then she says and I love the tenacity of this woman she says yes Lord but even the dogs can lick up the crumbs under the master's table. And the Bible says he was so moved by her great faith that he granted her petition. In other words, Jesus said, now listen, lady. He says, I am not supposed to do this until after Calvary. But you, your faith is drawing on me and pulling on me so much that I can't help uh, 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 healing you right now, healing your daughter and, and your, your prayer request is granted. I, I needed to show you that because I'm going somewhere this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, he's going somewhere. So we see from scripture how important that bloodline of Abraham was to God. Being part of that seed meant that you are a benefactor of everyone who came before you in that bloodline. An example of this would be that in the New Testament over in the book of Hebrews, there was a guy by the name of Levi Levi uh, was Abraham's great-grandson. And the Bible says that Abraham paid tithes to God, but it was accredited to Levi for what Abraham did. In other words, Levi didn't do anything. Like, he didn't do anything. Just all, the only thing he did was breathe, Right? But because of who he was connected to, because of his great-granddaddy, 
who pay tithes and honor God with his giving, the Bible says that, that the, the, the blessing off of that tithe was credited to Levi. I guess you can say that it was in Levi's genes. Okay. This all sounds good, Pastor Doug. I thank you for the history lesson. But what's this got to do with me? Okay, I want to read this. This is my last verse I'm going to read today. And it's from Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read it also from the message. Verse 11. So he's talking to us Gentiles. And he says, but don't take any of this for granted. It was only yesterday that you outsiders, notice that word, you outsiders to God's ways had no idea of any of this, didn't know the first thing about the way God works, hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. But now, everybody say now. now. Because of Christ dying that death, shedding that blood, you who were once out of it all together are in on everything. Glory to God. I tell you, that's good news. Come on, I said that's good news. Well, if you won't shout, everybody at home, I know you just picture you shouting on that right now. I said, that's good news at home. <laughs> yeah. All that to say, watch this, and we're going to close. All that to say that you must be pretty valuable for God to go to that length. Yes, amen. To go to that length just to get you into the bloodline. Just to get you in there. Um, the Bible says in the book of Matthew the end of chapter one, it says that there were from Abraham to David were, was 14 generations. From David to Babylonian captivity was 14 generations. And from Babylonian captivity to Jesus was 14 generations. Uh, in fact, in order to illustrate this, can I have the guys, uh, if, if, uh, if I asked you earlier to come on up here, you guys, would you come on up? Yeah. You're not? Okay, yeah, come on, come on up. Just stand behind me here for a moment. Yeah, I need a couple more. There you go. Come on, Dad. Okay, I, I didn't tell these guys what we're going to do, but I'm going to illustrate this. Okay, come here. Stand right here in the line right here. Okay, so turn around and look that way. Look, look, look at that wall right down there, okay? Just look at that wall. Stand right in a straight line, right in a straight line behind, okay? Well, now you're not in a straight line. Okay, well, it would just follow the leader in front of you. Just get in there, there you go. All right, so, so here's what I want you to do. From, so I want you to put your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you like that. Move up a little bit closer there. All right, I know this is not comfortable, and if you wouldn't have come to church if you didn't know I was going to ask you to do this, okay? <laughs> So, I love how we have father, son, son, father up here. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to happen, but this is what it did. Okay. From Abraham to David was 14 generations. From David to Babylonian captivity was 14 generations. From Babylonian captivity to Jesus was 14 generations. So, so God speaks this covenant to Abraham and says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your seed. In fact, look up. You see the stars? Can you count them? You can't? I can't. I'm God. But I'm going to number your seed as the stars of the heavens. Look down. You see that? You count all the sand on the seashore? You can't. I can. Because I created it. Your seed is going to be numbered that big and that powerful just as the sands of the seashore. And I'm going to bless you exceedingly. And your, 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 your children are going to be blessed. And your children's children are going to be blessed to a thousand generations. And so he speaks this blessing and this covenant through a man named Abraham. And of course, uh, you know, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and, you know, all these, this, this bloodline continued to flow 
Um, so we've got, we got Abraham, then we've got, we got David. Little David, we got right here. Amen. Quick with a sling. Really good at it, by the way. Right? And then from David to the Babylonian Empire, we got someone like Daniel in that era, who's, who's by the way, was the dentist to the lions. And so, right? And then from, from Babylonian Empire, 14 generations later, have you ever been, you ever played the part of Jesus? You actually have, huh? In a play one time. Hey, man, this, this is going to be powerful. Ready? Here's the problem. I'm a Gentile. I want God to bless me, my family. I see what they got, and I want in on it. But I can't get in on it because I can't get in. It's locked up. The bloodline is locked to one family, to one bloodline, and I'm unable to get in because I'm not of the right stock. I'm not of the right bloodline, right? So what what am I going to be able to do? For, for, For 42 generations later, from Abraham and the 42nd generation shows up, and his name is Jesus, and he has an answer for us. So for 41 generations, me and my family aren't able to get into the bloodline because we don't have the right stuff. We're the wrong stock, right? We're not able to get through the bloodline. But when Jesus hung on the cross and and his blood began to pour out, for the first time, suddenly... The bloodline that had once only flowed in this direction is now beginning to flow in this direction. (laughs) And for the first time, it is now including more than just one nationality and one race. For the first time in history, and now suddenly, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And so now for the very first time, now for the very first time, someone like me who couldn't get into the bloodline If I just, his blood is now being poured out into the earth and that blood is now whosoever will. Whosoever will. So if I would just believe on him and receive him by faith, now, guess what? I'm I'm part of the family. I'm part of the family. You say, Pastor Doug, but, but what if I messed up like big time? What if, what if I asked Jesus to come into my life and then, but I messed up, I, I, I failed, I sinned, I, I, I broke my commitment, I broke my promise, I'm, I'm messed up, tore up, jacked up from the floor up, I just can't even begin to talk about everything that I've done wrong. You might have, you might have, but here's the difference. The blood that Jesus shed for me, way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, will never ever lose its power for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for his blood. Come on church, I said I'm thankful for his blood. And now I'm part of the family. I'm part of it. Hallelujah. Listen, listen, listen. We're going to be done here in a minute. Hey, can you you give these guys a hand right now? Thank you so much. We're going to be done here in a moment. The reason I'm zooming in on this over the last couple weeks is because I have peers in ministry who don't have the same convictions that I have. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying, I mean, their convictions are their convictions. But they they would have a deep concern over people hearing a message like this. Because their concern is that people would hear a message like this in 
and start to get a little bit puffed up. Can, can I say that I don't, I don't share those same deep convictions that some of my peers in ministry also share? And here's why. Because sin has left its mark of guilt and condemnation through something called inherited iniquities. And while some people can get puffed up, uh, they, they can start to get maybe a little bit of a big head and not understand the, the real message of grace. I get that. As a pastor, can I tell you that some of the most dangerous belief systems that I have come across is what, when I see uh, what, coming out of people like you and me are people who continue to marginalize the value that God has placed upon their lives. When I read, for example, Ephesians, and I start in chapter 1, He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He chose us from the foundation of the world. He lavished His grace on us. He predestined us through adoption to become a part of his very own family. I know there's always going to be some people who, who need to get their pride held in check. I get that. But can I just say I'm not nearly as concerned about that as I am men and women of God not understanding who God has created us to be. He crowned me with glory and honor. He uh, made me, uh, gave me dominion over the work of his hands. He made us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, consequently therefore, we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So don't try to make me feel small of myself because I'm a child of the Most High God. I, I, I'm in the bloodline and I have royal blood flowing through my veins. And God sees that you are valuable. He sees that you are valuable. Out of eight billion people on the planet, He chose to draw you to Himself. Why? The blood of Jesus. Yes. The blood of Jesus. You want to know why Abraham said, I'm afraid? Because of the enemy's uh, mind twisting attacks on people who God has chosen and given purpose to, that they would not understand their identity in Christ. And therefore, they can never love him the way they were created to love him. That's why Paul said he was afraid. Amen. But the blood. But the blood.